Welcome back to the Ross Bolin Podcast, presented by Bolin Media. I am, you guessed it, Ross Bolin, here today with my producer, co-host, and companion, Cade Oris. Cade, say hello to the children. Hello, children. Do you know it's a leap year? I did not, no. Something to be aware of. Okay, so that means there's another day in... Yes. February, right? This month. This month. This month, okay. We got an extra day tacked on to the end. Wow, no, I did not know that. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for that, yeah. Before we dive into today's segments, I wanted to put in a good word for some of our other shows here at Bolin Media, as it is about to be busy season for me and the boys. F1 Racing is back as the 2024 F1 season begins this week in Bahrain? Bahrain? Bahrain. 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 With the Formula One Gulf Air Bahrain Grand Prix. And there's only one man you need to keep you in the loop on all the biggest F1 news, drama, and action all season long. J-Bone, a.k.a. Jared Borislow, your host of Bolin Media's premier F1 programming, Formula Bone. You can watch Formula Bone on YouTube.com slash at Formula Bone. Catch clips on all the social media platforms at Formula Bone and or listen to Formula Bone on major podcast platforms. Speaking of seasons starting, the series premiere of Shogun will be available on Hulu and FX tonight. Actually, two episodes they're dropping to kick off Shogun. And that is the next show we are covering on Oysters, Clams, and Cockles, Bolin Media's number one TV and film podcast hosted by myself and one of my best friends of over 20 years, Barrett Dudley. Check out Oysters, Clams, and Cockles on YouTube and major podcast platforms as well. Also, baseball season is nearly upon us with spring training games currently taking place and opening day merely a month away now. So I would be remiss if I didn't take the time to remind all the Houston sports fans out there of my Houston sports podcast, Banging the Can, available on YouTube and major podcast platforms. Thank you for supporting Bowlin Media Podcasts and our sponsors which is more important than ever, as we finally hired a full-time ad sales guy, Dan the Ad Salesman, who you can meet on this week's Patreon-exclusive episode of the Ross Boland Podcast on patreon.com slash Podcast, where Dan, Cade, and I will all be wearing suits and talking business later this week. Now, as many of you are aware, I quit drinking alcohol in October of 2017, coming up on seven years of dryness. Please clap. And for the longest time, thank you, Kate, I did not understand the concept of non-alcoholic beers. Like I, I was never drinking beers for the flavor. I but, was, but they taste so good, though. Because they get you fucked up. Like, I was drinking beers to get fucked up because the world is a vampire and life is pain, and if you drink enough beers, you stop feeling feelings. But, like, let's just say hypothetically, Cade, somebody tells you right now, like a doctor kicks in the door and they come in and they say, Cade, we got bad news. You can't drink beers anymore or you'll die. You're done. No more, no more alcoholic beers. Okay. For whatever reason, alcohol is going to kill you. Just like alcohol in general, I, I, just, well, just Let's just apply it to beers. Okay. Alcoholic beers are going to kill you. Yeah. Are you going to fill that gap with non-alcoholic beers? Like, is beer taste still something you're going to pursue? No, I do not care about the taste of beer at all. I actually think they all kind of taste the same, regardless of, like, what you put in front of me. Well, that's a ridiculous statement. They definitely don't all taste the same. I know, but, like... Like an IPA versus, like, a... Yeah, and IPAs taste worse than like the other shit. I think they taste better, but that's not how I felt years ago when I was actually drinking, which is ironic. Like the the IPA, the non-alcoholic IPAs are really, really good, but I didn't really like IPAs when I was crushing beers all the time. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I've just I've never understood non-alcoholic beers because non-alcoholic beers notoriously taste like beers but do not get you fucked up like beers. So, it, I just didn't get it. Well, after almost seven years of being a soda connoisseur and drinking Sprite or root beer with every single dinner, I think I finally broke. So, my boy Barrett, who was not drinking regular beers because he was trying to go into his wedding weekend as healthily as possible. I think he was getting trim, trying to add yeah. some glow to to look his, his best yeah. when it was a big day. So he brought some NA beers to my Super Bowl party, 
And I tried one, and it was phenomenal, right? The first sip I took, it was like seeing an old friend for the first time in decades, or in this case, seven years. It was like, like a first kiss with a new crush. Like going back to the campus of a school you once attended in another life and feeling the waves of nostalgia rush mm. over you. Because I spent a lot of time with beers back in the day. Yeah, did it make you want to hop back on the wagon at all? No, but I did have that thought. <laughs> I, I told Barrett, I was like, man, these, these might be like dangerous for like hardcore alcoholics. Like if you'd been off the wagon for like a long time and then you had a, one of these new age non-alcoholic beers that taste phenomenal it might f- like get you, it might put you in a bad place mentally I, I just a thought um, but the brand of non-alcoholic beer he brought over is called athletic mm. it's for athletes who are athletic like me of course yeah. I'm pretty much the exact perfect ideal customer you're, you're the poster child I am I am yeah yeah just a consummate athlete and uh, I've already got Dan, the ad salesman, working on trying to get them as a sponsor for our show somehow, but no idea if that's actually possible. Anyway, Athletic goes extremely hard, and I'm stoked to be able to have a beer or two while watching the sports ball or, or have dinner, but not wake up the next morning naked on my back porch to find my wife and kids are gone because I blacked out and tried to fight my neighbors. So this is huge for me. And this weekend, I was at Barrett's wedding, black tie, Real nice, Clark. And for people who don't drink, there is no worse social situation than a wedding. Because everybody drinks at weddings. And everybody drinks more than they usually drink at weddings. Yeah, because most of the time it's an open bar. It's a celebration. Yeah. You're like, yeah, we're going to get real fucked up tonight. It's a big crowd. Right. A lot of social anxiety. A lot lot of friends and family around. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people you haven't seen in a while in some cases, right? So people throw down harder at weddings than they do in normal situations even. So, like, you'll see people at weddings who are not big drinkers who get just absolutely obliterated. <laughs> just to <laughs> to a point that is, frankly, really annoying if you're sober. Right. Like, it's, it's watching the escalation that kills me. Like, when I show up, reception, people are sober. Yeah. Or ceremony, I mean. People are sober. Beginning of the reception, everybody's getting a little loose. But by the time it's like cake cutting and dance floor opening up, Ooh. people are yelling in my fucking face. <laughs> Breath is starting to stink like pure alcohol. It's just it just gets worse and worse throughout the night. And then there's a point at it, it Barrett's wedding. It was about ten thirty where I said I no longer belong here. This is, things have gotten out of control, <laughs> and I need to go. Yeah, not for the the sober people. No, at that it's point tough. In the night. Weddings are tough. So I was at the bar at the wedding. And I, I thought I saw that the bar had this beer I'm talking about, Athletic, because there were a few beer cans on display with an A on them, or what looked like an A to me. And I was like, hey, I think that's the beer Barrett brought over to my house. So I went up and I asked the bartender, hey, is that a non-alcoholic beer? And she goes, no. <laughs> and I go, oh. But she continues, I've got some in the back, though. And after an extended back and forth of of me being like, no, 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 that's okay, and her being like, well, I insist, she goes and grabs me some of the N.A. beer that they had in supply, which was called Peroni. And Mm. it was dog shit compared to Athletic. It was absolute trash. Boo, Peroni, step your fucking game up. But I still, I had like three of these things over the course of the wedding. Because it, you... I, I want something in my damn hand. Yeah. Did they not have like any mocktails or anything like that? Nah, because it was like a select bar. You know, okay, you, yeah. when you do open bar at a wedding, you got to like pick the package. Right, yeah. And they're different tiers and costs or whatever. Um, you don't want to go with like a Sprite or anything like that? No, because that's part of the, 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 the shift here. I, I think I'm burned out on Sprite and root beer and Dr. Pepper. And ju- I've just been doing the soda game so hard for so long, you know? Yeah. That that I... You just want to switch it up a I little bit. I need something new. Yeah. I need something and it different. it makes you feel like more of an adult. Like a little... Like, yeah. Like a, just a dad beer yeah. for me, please. An N.A. dad beer. So I had my first bad non-alcoholic beer experience at this wedding, but I didn't let it break me. I went to the grocery store the next day, and I grabbed some athletic... And I grabbed some of Blue Moon's N.A. beer to try out as well, which I have not had yet, but I'm stoked on that because I loved Blue Moon when I was still drinking. 
Um, but it turns out this market, the non-alcoholic beer market, has fucking exploded. And we need to get in on this shit sponsorship-wise because I'm sick of mowing the lawn shirtless and having a starry. It's just not the same vibe. You know? <laughs> yeah. So if we can somehow get in on this, find a non-athletic beer to sponsor the show that can ship me crates of this shit. A non-athletic beer? A non-alcoholic beer <laughs> for athletes. I misspoke. Uh, then that would be great. So that's that's what we're working on. Next, af- the next iteration after this, the next shift will be getting into these alcohol-free THC beers. Seen some of those, but I've never tried one. Yeah, the state of Texas refuses to legalize the good shit, so it might be a while before we can try one here. But it looks like, I was looking into them this morning, and it looks like there's like 2.5 milligrams of THC per beer can. Okay. Right? And no alcohol in it. It's just like, it tastes like beer, but 2.5 milligrams. So if you could have like, you know, I could have like five of those. And that would get you right? And then be, theoretically... Pretty stoned. Yeah. Fair, you know, at least a little high. Because I get over the 10 milligram mark, and that's when I start to feel toasty. <laughs> so uh, I love that concept. Because mm-hmm. that's part of the fun of drinking beers, Cade. It's getting high? Well, no, it's, it's, <laughs> it's finishing a beer. Oh, yeah? And then going to get another beer. Yeah, no, that is, that is pretty enjoyable. And then repeating that process until you feel good. <laughs> Yeah, then you reach a point where it no longer feels good, and you're like, ugh, I need to, probably need to go home now. You know? And then you reach the next morning, and you're filled with regret. Yeah. But anyway, I I long to have that experience again in my life, but I'll, I'll need it to be with uh, either these pure non-alcoholic beers that we've got currently, or at some point if Texas ever legalizes cannabis to the full extent of, you know, mm-hmm. Delta 9 instead of just 8 Cause you can get like some Delta Eight infused beers here. I'm not, no, no I'm not, not interested. No, that's not the real thing. I don't. Yeah. It's not the same. No. It's just not the same. But, I mean, I kind of already do that with the. I drink beer and then I just smoke, and so I kind of get the same effect. I get, I get double the effects. Really. Yeah, you. Well, you're getting the full on <laughs> alcohol plus weed effect, yeah. which is that's yeah, a whole different animal. That, have they made that yet? Like, I'm, oh, I'm sure that exists. Mm. Well, maybe not. I don't know if that's I'll, if it's legal. I don't know how that would work. Multiple like, substances in one can? Yeah. Uh, you get high and drunk? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That, if they, that's don't the beer for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's dangerous shit there, uh, kid. So are you, yeah, probably. Um, so you're just like going all in. You're going to try a bunch of different ones and see which ones you like? Yeah, I'm just know? trying to make sure I've got, like, because the athletic is really, really good. I really like it. Yeah. But I want to make, you know, I want to try out some different. They, first of all, they got a couple different flavors of athletic, mm-hmm. but then there's like the Blue Moon one. There's like a Budweiser one that I was like, eh, mm. I don't know about that. Yeah, so do all like the major um, all, all of beer them brands have like yeah, non-alcoholic it's crazy. stuff now? It's crazy. Nice. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting my feet wet, you yeah. know? What was your go-to like back in the day beer-wise? Uh, well, in college, well, in, I should, in high school, <laughs> <laughs> in high school and college, I was a Keystone Light guy, mm, and we we would the go good through stuff. Yeah, we would go through phases with Natural Light yeah. as well, just the cheapest, shittiest right, possible beers, right? Uh, and then at some point, I was like, "This is piss water," and I'm a man, <laughs> and I graduated to Miller Light. That was my okay. light beer of choice, Miller Light. Miller Light, and I don't really know why. I just pure branding, yeah, because they all taste the fucking. I just said that you're like, no, you're wrong. Well, I mean, all the light beers, <laughs> yeah, that's all, that yeah, are okay. watered down trash taste the same, yeah, for the most part. And that's all I drink is watered down trash. Well, yeah, but I mean, like that. There's di- like a full on, you know, Bud Heavy tastes a lot different than like a Miller Light. Yeah, and then all the IPAs are fucking crazy. You got like orange flavored shit in there. Mm-hmm. I don't even know what's going on in that world. I no. I'm just now gonna find out without alcohol in them. <laughs> but uh but yeah, that, I think that, that I never got further than that. You yeah. know? Yeah, you didn't get, I tried were IPAs it, I tr- like big. In yeah, your they, day? they had blown up. Like yeah. they got really big in Austin. Like I would go to um Pint House Pizza. Okay, yeah. And they have like a fucking absurd, like, you know, three hundred IPAs you can pick from or whatever. And I tried some of them. But I didn't really like them. Yeah. But again, at that point, I was really only drinking to get fucked up. Mm-hmm. Like that was, I that wasn't was like, ah, oh, I, I desire the taste of a... It's been a long, hard day. I want to... Yeah. An IPA and relax a little bit, you know. 
Well, I mean, yeah, but the 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 follow up thought was like, and now I want another one, yeah, and then another, another one, and another, maybe and six more, yeah, then maybe a shot or two, and maybe <laughs> maybe move on to hard liquor, <laughs> <laughs> and then smoke some weed and yeah. wake up the next day and not know where I am, <laughs> can't find my pants, you know, yeah, uh, I was, Hap- the, happens to the best of the us. The progression was pretty consistent with me though. It was, <laughs> it was like every time. At some point, I realized that was a problem. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I'm I'm excited about the non-alcoholic beer movement, where it's going, and how. I'd like to hear more about this journey. I'm you're gonna going to be a part. I know you love this. <laughs> Fascinating. Hey, to you. we can we can drink together finally. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> have a beer. I just have to make sure not to switch mine with yours. Yeah. You know. Yeah, that would be seven years down mistake. the drain. Yeah. <laughs> Pants are gone again, and I'm back oh, in no. county jail. Can't have that. In other exciting news, I got my car washed this morning. I figured I'd go get the car wash, write today's show while I was waiting, you know, in the Mm -hmm. fucking lobby, because it takes like an hour inexplicably to wash my tiny car. You're not going through like the self-wash? You're you're like not supposed... I think the Tesla has like some special paint or something. Thanks for making me say this. Uh, (laughs) So you're not supposed to, I don't think. But And there's a car wash right next to my house. So I was like, fuck it, I'll go. It's it's not expensive. It's like, I think... What I did get today would have cost like forty bucks, which isn't too too bad. Yeah, you're paying more than that for your hair. I am with yeah. your crazy expensive haircuts. Um, but it's like gloomy outside today, so I thought you know there'd be no line. Like last week, the weather was phenomenal, so this place was packed all day every day. And when I pulled in, you know, you you have you ever gone to a car wash that's not self serve? Like one of these ones where you like get out of your car, you pick something on the menu, they write some shit on the window. Um, no, like I've always done the self wash, but like I have had to get out of my cards for them to like do the interior. Yeah. And like vacuum it and stuff. Like that's all I've ever done. Okay. Yeah. Well, when you pull in, there's always a guy who approaches your vehicle and they try to sell you a package. They're like, All right, what do you want today? And then they're like, How many cars you got? <laughs> is the first question they ask, and I lied. I said just this one because I'm. They want to know if you're like in a family. Are you married? Does your wife have a car? Do your kids have cars? Because what they're trying to pitch you on is this tin wash package. Okay, and what, what do you get with the tin? It's wash? like it's like significantly discounted. If you'll commit to tin washes now, okay, you get those washes for much cheaper than if you paid for them individually. And seeing as this place is right by my house. And I need to get my car washed probably more often than I currently do get it washed because the kids are in the back seat just fucking shredding snacks and throwing them all over the place like confetti. Yeah, I got dogs. Dog, the dog hair in my car, yeah. kid. Oh my god, it's mm. disgusting. But uh, I got talked into it. This is the first time that I was like, okay, you know what? I'll do the tin packet, the tin wash package. Give me that thing because the dude that I was greeted by when I pulled in had great vibes. He made me feel welcome. And warm at this car wash. And I never fall for this upselling shit. I'm always like, when they start talking about the package, I'm like, no, 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 I'm good. I'm just this, this, just, just today, thank you. I'm not looking for a long-term car wash commitment. I'm still not quite sure how this works as a business incentive for them. But uh, today I was like, you know what, why not? But this is how these car wash fuckers get you, man. They've got this shift manager. Somebody with their shit together out there greeting you and upselling you. Like the guy that sold me this package is the most professional person at this car wash by far. He's on another level from everybody else working there. And so you feel like, yeah, this responsible and reasonable individual that I'm talking to right now will take good care of my car. Was that not the case? That's not the dude okay. washing your car. Oh. That's just the dude selling you the car wash. So he was selling this to you before you got to see the end results of your car wash. Right. Just pulled up. Just driven up. Guy walks up to the window. You consult the menu. And then he upsells you on the tin wash package. Mm. So then you get out and you hand him your keys and you go sit inside while they do their thing. In and, and that sentence, they... Is not him at all. He's just the sales guy slash, like I said, like most professional person, probably the manager. Mm -hmm. Um, Because the dude washing your car, like actually doing the work, 
is some burned out meth addict barely clinging to consciousness who hasn't showered in days and can barely fucking walk. Well, he's at the car wash. I mean, at least he's getting some like a little outdoor some, sunshine. Yeah, and a little little shower, like you know, the water gets on you and stuff. Yeah, Get the suds and everything. <laughs> I'm sure he's getting some. Sh- yeah, I don't know if that counts though. I don't know if it counts. But every person you deal with at the car wash just just gets like progressively shittier. So that first dude that I was describing who made me feel warm and welcome, like that's the A team. You are greeted by the A team. Then the cashier that you go inside to pay, that's the B team, and it's where you start to see some cracks in the operation. Mm-hmm. You're just like, oh. You don't make me feel nearly as comfortable as that man did. And then down the line you go until you meet the guy who's actually washed your car. And you meet that guy when he comes in to tell you that your car is ready. And that guy, and no offense to that guy, but I know the type, I have spent enough time in county jails, and this dude most definitely has as well. And that is the dude who washed my car, and my God, did he do just the worst job imaginable. Like, they, they they basically escort you out to your vehicle to inspect it. And I'm assuming a lot of, you know, more uh, confrontation-friendly people inspect the vehicle and then say, like, oh, you missed some spots here. Can you vacuum over here? Or, you know, maybe you forgot to do the trunk, like, shit like that. Yeah. Well, if I'm not... No, you're not doing I'm not that. dealing with no. that. I'm not fucking going through that. I don't feel like it... And, frankly, getting shanked was not on my list of shit to do today. And, like I said, this gentleman seemed like he might be packing. He might be... He might be one to stab me <laughs> if I complained about his performance. So... I just, like, looked in the car and was just like, yep, thanks, and, like, handed him a $10 bill for a tip and then got in. Have you tipped him, too? I had, dude, I had to. I had to. <laughs> I had not to. obligated last to Last time I was there, I didn't tip, and I felt bad. Oh, so there's Because as I was driving away, time. they were just looking at me. Well, that time, I didn't tip because I got tag-teamed. The guy came in to get me. Mm-hmm. Your car is ready. And when I came out, it was him and another guy standing there looking for my approval. Like, there was two of them that had done it, and I was like, I don't. Do I tip bo- oh, both yeah. of you? Or are you going to split this? What the fuck is happening? So I felt too much pressure, and I just got in and peeled off and drove out. And as I could see in my rear view as I drove away, they just looked so disappointed. See, maybe they remember you. You're like, hey, we're going to do an even shittier job this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did, because it looked like he basically just sprayed a bottle of leather seat cleaning liquid all over the inside of my car. And then instead of just wiping anything at all, he just sat down and took like an hour-long cigarette smoking break and waited for it to dry, which it had not by the time I got into it. So I was like slipping and sliding all over my driver's seat. But an absolutely piss-poor effort. And uh, again, like I'm not the type to examine the car and give notes and wait for them to do the things I've now said and just pray he doesn't like piss in my trunk or something out of spite. So I said, fuck it, and left. Um, Anyway, the point of the story, it's not really a moral but it is a point. I've got 10 more of these sub-mediocre car washes in my wallet, and today's, this was part of the upsell, today's was technically free. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Well, see, you can use one of them and go take it back today and, no, get it fully. Free, I get a different Or No, just, like, do, uh, come, like, the full job now, you know? Like, it takes two washes yeah. to get the job done. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, you got... So, really, I bought five. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, every because I gotta go twice gotta every time, twice. yeah, to make sure that they actually yeah. do it. Uh yeah. yeah. Anyway. Or I could I could do it for you. Yeah. Too, sometime you know I'll get. Oh, the- they did mention that after the fact. It's yeah, I could send any vehicle there. Okay. So like my wife could go, you could go. Yeah. You know, you just all you need is my name, and then and I, I you get sign the- into a log book. Okay, and I get the discount. When there's there's no discount, I already paid for it. Oh, okay. So the next 10 times I go there, no cash will exchange hands. And oh. the way they get it, I think the way they, they like, you know, get in on the margins is by doing a terrible job. Yeah, to make you keep coming back. But I feel like that... It's so you come the, back more quickly or just, like, their whole their whole product is manpower, right? It's, it's ma- men working mm-hmm. hours, Yeah, you know? So the less time they spend on your car, the more cars they can get through. Okay, yeah. So just they commit less time, do a shittier job, and just get you in and out, which is it's not great. And then great. they sell the, the tin. And then they give you these packages. So you just keep coming back, and so you get your, your car fully cleaned. Yeah, no, see, I don't 
I don't do the, the 10 package. Don't ever do it. No. Don't ever do it. This uh, is my first time, and it'll be my last. Yeah, no, I just go out and do it by myself. You know, I'll wear like a, a That's what I normally bikini, do. get like yeah. really sudsy. Fuck and like, yeah. Yeah, just go to Tweak town. Tweak your nipples a little so that they're yeah. like poking, you know? Yeah, you know, take the um, little, um, what is it? Thing sponge? That sponge. Yeah, just squeeze it oh, all over yeah. me. Yeah. Drink the suds. <laughs> yeah. The toxic soap. <laughs> No, yeah. look, I usually do wash my own car. It's one of the reasons I've never done one of these packages, because I enjoy that. I kind of like washing the car. Mm-hmm. It's one of those things that you hate when you're a kid, but then when you have kids that you're trying to get away from all the time, you like going to wash the car, because... Yeah, it's like you're forced to do it as a child, so right. you hated it, and then yeah. like as an adult, you appreciate it more, because, you know, yeah, you're... You escape the family. Yeah. Same thing with the lawn mowing. Mm-hmm. I love doing the yard now. Yeah. Because there's nobody yelling in my ear for a fucking snack the whole time I'm doing it because I can't hear them if they are. Right. Lawnmower's too loud. Yeah, Sorry, I can't no. hear you. Sorry, go back inside. Mm-hmm. Go back inside. Daddy will be done in two and a half hours. Yeah, I'm also, it took an hour for them to do this. A little Model 3. It's a tiny car. That's how long it takes me to do it if I'm alone. And I'm, yeah. and I'm talking about doing like a bang up job yeah. inside and outside, exterior and interior, wheels and shit, all of it. About an hour. Yeah. Which is part of the reason I wanted to go to the car wash today, because I don't typically have like a free fucking hour anymore. Right. It's not a thing that happens for me. But yeah, it took them an hour, man. It took forever. And they had multiple guys working on it? And then should... I honestly don't know. I was... <laughs> there was just that one. It might have just been that one crackhead, dude. <laughs> he was just out there fucking tweaking and, you know, trying to get a tip. So that's the, as I was handing him the $10, I was like, I know exactly. <laughs> Where you where this is going? Yep, it's not a bank. <laughs> well, it's his bank. <laughs> it's a dealer. Yeah, that's where it's going. Uh, all in all, an eventful experience at the car wash once again. Today's episode is brought to you by Shopify. Chappelle and Neil, Key and Peel, Faye and Polar, set up and punchline. So, what about the perfect duo when it comes to growing your business? That's you. And Shopify. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business, from the launcher online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage. Shopify is there to help you grow, whether you're selling merchandise for your podcast or handmade kaleidoscopes. Shopify simplifies selling online and in person so you can focus on successfully growing your business. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout up to 36% better compared to uh, other leading commerce platforms, and sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Selling merchandise for our podcast here at Bolin Media, big supplemental revenue source for us, allows us to provide our biggest fans and supporters with shirts and hats and coffee mugs and puzzles that they can wear and use in real life to show their support for Bolin Media and our shows. And Shopify can be the platform that enables you to connect with your supporters in the same way I have used Shopify extensively. It is amazing. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's extensive help resources are there to support your success every step of the way because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period Period at shopify.com slash rbp all lowercase all lowercase shopify.com slash rbp go now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in shopify.com slash rbp all right i've got an insane headline of the day today that's going to uh transition into an animal of the week Ooh. never done before wow wow yeah good, really special stuff. here's your headline Texas startup working to bring back woolly mammoths to be center of new docu series. You know what a woolly mammoth is, right? You're familiar, right? Yeah, I'm right? familiar. Yeah, you know they're age. gone. Yeah, no, no, they're not they're gone for some time anymore. Yeah. Did it's you very... say Ice Age? Yeah. Like the movie, or uh, like the time period? Both. Both. Yeah. Little column A, little column B. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good movie. <laughs> Great movie, I yeah. think there's like three of them, but I've only seen the first. Yeah. That little squirrel, he's just trying to... Just trying to get, get save his that nut, nut you yeah. know? Keep that nut safe. Mm-hmm. We can all relate. Right. 
Anyway, from the Austin American Statesman, the Texas de-extinction company working on bringing back the woolly mammoth and other extinct species will be the center of a multi-year documentary series. Colossal Biosciences was co-founded by Austin entrepreneur Ben Lamb and geneticist George Church of Harvard Medical School in 2021 with the goal of advancing the field of de-extinction and combating climate change. The company has offices in Austin, Dallas, and Boston, and also works with a team at the University of Melbourne, which I assume is in Australia. In 2022, Colossal also spun off a company, Form Bio, an Austin-based computational life science startup, no idea what that means, which still works closely with Colossal. It says the docu-series aims to give viewers a front-row seat to the company's efforts and will follow Colossal for the next five years as the company works to bring back various species with the goal of rewilding them into their natural habitats. The series is designed to show the company's genetic engineering work along with other technologies. Now, before I continue, this feels much like AI, like one of those things that starts off, you know, that sounds tight at the beginning of the movie. Right. Before all hell breaks all loose. All hell breaks loose, yeah. everything goes horribly wrong, and we all die. Yeah. I mean, no, this is just Jurassic Park, is it's it not? literally the plot of the film. Yeah. Except they were like, okay, well... People are going to be freaked out if we start with the T-Rex. Let's start with the friendly-looking furry elephant. Yeah. The woolly mammoth. Yeah, it got to ease the people into it. Yeah, and even then once I, we crush that... Even though I feel like woolly mammoths could also, you know, fuck, fuck up some our shit day. up, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Right? They're going to rewatch... So, like, let's just... Hypothetically, they, they succeed. Mm-hmm. They bring the woolly mammoth back into existence. De-extinct it, as they call it. And they're going to release it into the fucking wild, which I assume is like, I don't know, on Antarctica or some shit? Yeah, I don't, no idea what, what their natural right? habitat is. Because it can't, really. be, can't be like here. No, I don't You can't have like woolly mammoths running around. Yeah, I'd feel like they wouldn't be able to survive out here. It's fucking hot as hell. They're all woolly. The yeah, they're all wool. They got sweaters <laughs> permanently attached to their bodies. They can't, they can't be here in Texas. We can't be doing the show and a woolly mammoth just come crashing through the wall. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't be good. It'd be detrimental to our business. Mm -hmm. Back to the article. Colossal has previously made headlines for its plans to bring back the woolly mammoth, the Tasmanian tiger, and the dodo. Don't we already, we already have enough tigers, don't we? Don't, don't know, but I know we don't need a new one. Tasmanian one. No. That spins really fast. <laughs> right, because, yeah, that's what all... That's what Tasmanian <laughs> animals do. Yeah. I will say I'm down for the return of the dodo. More on that in a minute. The company plans to use breakthrough gene editing technologies such as CRISPR, which looks like CRISPR, CRISPR yeah. <laughs> to restore extinct animals, and has been working to develop innovative technologies to aid its efforts. Colossal has also partnered to help save the quickly disappearing northern white rhino species. With the extinct animals, the company aims to create hybrids of the animals that look and act like their extinct ancestors. For example... If successful, Colossal's mammoth would be a hybrid of an Asian elephant and a woolly mammoth. So it's like how in Jurassic Park, all the dinosaurs had frog DNA. Oh, that's, that's how they... That's they how they ended up... If you remember the point where uh, uh, that one dude says, like, nature finds a way. Because you're talking about how all the dinosaurs are females, so they can't reproduce. So they don't have to worry about, like, the, the population of the dinosaurs on the island getting out of control. Because okay, they're yeah. all women, mm -hmm. but then because they used frog DNA, and apparently frogs have the ability or to change sex. Some of them became the dinosaurs started male. reproducing, mm. and they found like dinosaur eggs, and that was problematic at Jurassic Park, which is of course not real. It was a, <laughs> it's a series of films. This is a movie that's still going on now. They're making like another Jurassic uh, World. Yeah, they they keep. Can we just fucking them? move on. <laughs> At some point, they're going to attach, like, machine guns to the pterodactyls in these films or something. Because, like, how can it escalate any further than it already has? I no, like I think done that, everything. that's the next step is, yeah. You got to put machine guns. Well, that's what they've been doing, I think, or what they've been wanting to do. Like, the bad guys are like, oh, we want to turn them into, like, things to use Weapons for the military. Weapons of war? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. I watched Oppenheimer again the other day. We've got bombs. Do we really need <laughs> dinosaurs with <laughs> guns on their wings? No. Anyway. Shocking that Jurassic Park is still pumping them out. Well, all, all together, not that shocking because yeah. this is what Hollywood so does. So, is it 
they're like cloning almost essentially or like how or is it literally just like how they did it in Jurassic I think Park it's, it's, almost? I mean, but instead of the frogs, they're, they're using, using like, like an Asian that. elephant. Yeah. So the For, closest animal they can figure yeah. to it. Uh, it says Colossal, along with production partner Teton Ridge Entertainment, signed an agreement with James Reed, the director behind the Netflix documentary My Octopus Teacher, and his company Underdog Films to produce the series. Did you ever watch that Octopus Teacher? Uh, no, probably not. You hear about it? Did you see see about it? Uh, uh, no. I remember seeing like the trailer, and I heard it was absolutely amazing because it shows like how intelligent and emotional octopuses are. Okay. Octopi. Octopi, yeah. Octopuses Oct- doesn't sound right. No. <laughs> Octopi. Uh, I need to watch it because it sounds dope, but apparently that's the dude that would be doing this documentary on the de-extinction company. The first phase of production will be financed by Teton Ridge Entertainment with the intention of finding a distribution partner to bring the series to market. Colossal has also previously announced funding from Teton Ridge founder Thomas Toll. The docuseries announcement follows Colossal's hiring of former Hollywood executive Emily Castell as its new chief marketing officer earlier this year. Castell has worked on movies including Pacific Rim, Godzilla, and ding, 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 Jurassic World. Mm. They were like, we need somebody with real life experience <laughs> in the movies. Let's go get Emily Castell. It says next month, Lamb will also be speaking on a panel at South by Southwest along with actor and filmmaker Seth Green. That's exactly, you know that's, what? That's we started, what you want. We started reading the column. I was like, God, I wonder how Seth Green is going to be pulled into this. <laughs> the Just, fuck does you know, Seth a, Green have a, to do with anything? An expert in this field. He did do Robot Chicken. You know? Yeah. Did you ever watch Robot Chicken oh, yeah. on Adult cool. Swim? God, cool. that shit's funny. Yeah. Like 10 minute episodes, just drunk and stoned out of your mind, yeah, you know? Nothing better. Nothing better. No. Says the two will be discussing Jurassic Park, how the franchise helped influence the de extinction field, and how it compares to actual technology Colossal uh, is using in its own efforts. Mm-hmm. Now, the part that they don't really get into in this column, and that I assume they avoid at all costs in real life conversations as well. In the film Jurassic Park, and I don't know if you've seen it recently, but... Uh, it's been a while, but I kind of have some idea. Well, it head. doesn't go well. No, it doesn't. Not in any of the, the films. The park doesn't even get to open before the dinosaurs escape and murder everyone, yeah. with the exception well, of a handful the, of survivor, survivors. And the uh, like newer ones with Chris Pratt, they do open it. They learn then, from their mistakes. Still, and then they still... The dinosaurs goes, get out and murder everyone. Yeah. <laughs> this is the same fucking plot in every single one of these movies. So, if you were taking Jurassic Park as inspiration, wouldn't you also take it in consideration the possible consequences of your insane yeah. scientific like, maybe actions? Maybe we shouldn't do this at all. But no, they went the opposite direction. They were like, maybe we should hire somebody who worked on Jurassic Park, mm-hmm. or World in this case, and then we bring in like Seth Green for laughs. And that'll make people forget that we might kill them all right. with woolly mammoths. And this is happening here? Here. Like, here and next, now. Next week? Yeah. A couple weeks? Yeah. Wow. Well, it probably cost like $1,500 to get oh, into to that, get though, into, or else yeah. I'd say we should go hang out. Yeah. Now, I'd love to hear what Seth Green has to say about this. The extinction? <laughs> yeah. The Where extinction. the fuck is Seth Green involved? <laughs> I cannot for the life of me. I guess. Oh, maybe he's just like really interested in it. Like like one of his hobbies, just like, oh, let me like look up. Well, like, in Austin Powers 1, they did try to attach freaking laser beams to the top of shark's heads. Oh, yeah. So that's kind <laughs> so, of the same. Yeah, science. totally. Science. Yeah. All right, we're, uh, we're moving on. And now, Ross Boland's Animal of the Week. Our Animal of the Week, the dodo bird. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the dodo, scientific name, Raphis cuculatus. <laughs> That stuff. Cuck? <laughs> is an extinct flightless bird that was endemic to the island of Mauritius, which is east of Madagascar in the Indian Ocean. The closest living relative of the dodo is the Nicobar pigeon. Damn. Fell hard and fast. The dodo's appearance in life is evidenced only by drawings, paintings, and written accounts from the 17th century. Since these portraits vary considerably, And since only some of these illustrations are known to have been drawn from live specimens, the dodo's exact appearance in life remains unresolved. And little is known about its behavior. So if you look up dodo bird on Google, that might not be what it looks like. I mean, they're pretty sure 
that's what it looked like. Oh, it's okay. just like they're they're having to go off of a bunch of different accounts and drawings and like random fossils and skulls and shits that they found. So they're not exactly sure like how large it was, for example, like its actual size. All it says is like bigger than a turkey. Bigger than a turkey. Wow. It so looks like we, some shit out of a video game. Yeah. So over. if we bring these back, are we going to start you now cooking those up for Thanksgiving? That's are a good we, question. Are we going to stick to the... There'll probably be some kind of restrictions on turning them into a holiday meal. Oh. Because they'll be brand new. Yeah. But also very old. And don't, we don't want them to go re- re-extinct. Extinct. Yeah. Because then you have to de-de-extinct yeah. them. It just gets... It gets confusing. And, yeah. Yeah. Messy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the dodo has been depicted with brownish gray plumage, yellow feet, a tuft of tail feathers, a gray naked head, and a black, yellow, and green beak. It used gizzard stones to help digest its food, which are these stones in their stomach that help like, grind up food. Mm. Uh, it's thought to have included fruits, their digestion or their uh, their uh, diet. And its main habitat is believed to have been the woods in the drier coastal areas of Mauritius. One account states that a dodo's clutch consisted of just a single egg, one egg at a time, and it is presumed that the dodo became flightless because of the ready availability of abundant food sources and a relative absence of predators on Meridius. So, because they didn't really fucking have to worry about anything, nothing trying to kill them, plenty of food around, don't need to go far for food, they didn't need to fly. Yeah, they're just chilling. Just dodos. Uh, it says, though the dodo has historically been portrayed as being fat and clumsy, it is now thought to have been well adapted for its ecosystem. And this is always what I've argued when people try to say that I'm lazy oh. and worthless. I say, no, I'm just well adapted for my ecosystem. The first recorded mention of the dodo was by Dutch sailors in 1598, some years ago, Cade. Yeah, just a little... No blast to the past. It says in the following years, the bird was hunted by sailors and invasive species while its habitat was being destroyed. Things turned for the dodo. The last widely accepted sighting of a dodo was in 1662. Its extinction was not immediately noticed, and some considered the bird to be a myth. And in the 19th century, research was conducted on a small quantity of remains of four specimens that had been brought to Europe in the early 17th century. Among these is a dried head, the only soft tissue of the dodo that remains today. So it's not like you can just go, like, do, you know, excavate the area that they used to live and find a bunch of dodo remains. Like, apparently, it's very hard to come by, which is why we know very little about them. But since then, a large amount of subfossil material has been collected on Meridius, mostly from the Mare Ox Sanjes Swamp. And uh, that's pretty much the one area you can go and find more dodo, apparently. The extinction of the dodo within less than a century of its discovery called attention to the previously unrecognized problem of human involvement in the disappearance of an entire species. So this is why the dodo is so famous. And why we learn, everybody learned about the dodo bird at some point in middle school, because it was the first species that really got people to go, oh shit, we have the ability to wipe out different species of animal if we're not careful. Yeah. Like, they will never recover and never come back. The dodo was, like, the first one because people love these dumbass oh, yeah. birds. But that didn't stop us. It didn't. No, no we, we just, we we've, just kept We've murdering. continued on our way. Yeah. Since 1662, not much has changed. <laughs> it says the dodo achieved widespread recognition from its role in the story of Alice Alice's adventures in Wonderland. Oh, that's... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's why I, I know what the dodo bird looks like in my head. And that's I, that's what all these drawings are based off of. It's Alice in Wonderland. Uh, it has since become a fixture in popular culture, often as a symbol of extinction and ab- obsolescence. Wait, you're talking about the, the dodo bird that looks like he, he was like a general in the 1700s? In Alice in Wonderland? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I can't remember what part that is, but he's got like a buddy with him that he uses as a chair, it looks like. A oh, toucan? it's like another bird. It's like a toucan. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why he had clothes <laughs> in Alice in Wonderland and was smoking a pipe. And he has like the, he's got the little like cat and the, like the white hair you see on like, it looks like George Washington almost. Yeah, yeah. 
Oh, you know what? I do know why it has clothes, because Lewis Carroll was on LSD. That's why. Oh, uh, okay. So, yeah. It makes that's sense. That's the dodo. Yeah. Glad yeah, we all learned something. When you're on something. LSD, you'll, you'll picture dodos and, and garb like that, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is what they're also working on No. See, that, that I want them to focus on first. Yeah. I wish they would de-extinct the dodo before the woolly mammoth yeah. or the Tasmanian tiger. Yeah, start tiger. small, you know? Yes, and, literally. And no, not something that could kill us all. Yeah. Like, I, we, I feel like we, if something were bad to happen with the dodos, we could take them out pretty easily. Right. We've well, done it once. Yeah, we could do it again. Exactly. Like, I think the woolly mammoth, that was more, you know, Mother Nature instead of us. You know how some areas there's just, like, peacocks wandering around? Yeah. Well, it would be cool if we had dodo if birds had doing do- that, yeah. too. Just chilling. That's know? my thought. Just being fat and clumsy. Yeah. Yeah. In their ecosystem. Yeah. 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 Good stuff. Yeah. Kate and I experienced very different weekends, with him out at the bars getting obliterated and looking for love, and me at home getting the living <laughs> shit kicked out of me by my kids. But when Monday rolls around, we're both in desperate need of recovery, so we celebrate Hydration Monday together with Liquid IV. When you have a big and busy weekend, staying hydrated often falls to the bottom of your priority list. That's why it's so important that once Monday rolls around, you catch up on hydrating your body with today's sponsor, Liquid IV. With three times the electrolytes of the leading sports drink, plus eight vitamins and nutrients for everyday wellness, Liquid IV hydrates two times faster than water alone, all in a single sugar-free stick. So you can feel like a hydrated new you, ready to take on whatever life throws your way. We have a massive almost outrageous supply of liquid IV here at the Bolin Media office, which makes us perhaps the most hydrated media company in the entire world. And Liquid IV has been one of our longest-running sponsors, supporting your favorite Bolin Media shows for years now. We love Liquid IV. It's delicious. It's effective. It's hydrating. What more can you ask for? One stick of Liquid IV and 16 ounces of water hydrates better than water alone with three times the electrolytes of the leading sports drink, no artificial sweeteners, and zero sugar. Contains eight vitamins and nutrients for everyday wellness, non-GMO and free from gluten, dairy, and soy. Replace Replaces sugar with a proprietary amino acid, allulose blend. Allulose is a naturally occurring sweetener with the same sweet taste and texture one can expect from table sugar. Weekends are for going wild. Have a game plan for Monday with Liquid IV. Grab your Liquid IV hydration multiplier sugar-free in bulk nationwide at Costco or get 20% off your first order when you go to liquidiv.com and use code ROSS at checkout. That's my name. 20% off your first order when you shop Superior Hydration today using promo code ROSS, R-O-S-S, at liquidiv.com. So as I said earlier in today's show, Major League Baseball has begun spring training, and as such, we are being exposed to the new MLB jerseys for the first time with billionaire Michael Rubin's fanatics being in charge of production in conjunction with Nike in some form or fashion. And because the trademark of fanatics is the lowest quality possible merchandise, it has, of course, been a hilarious shit show. Have you seen the results? Yeah, I've been seeing it uh, here and there on Twitter. So, like, the first few days, the big story was, like, these look like, Dog shit. There's they're wildly inconsistent. Sometimes like the MLB patch is up on the collar mm-hmm. by the back of your neck. Sometimes it's below it. Didn't seem like they had made a fucking decision there. So they were just like, ah, half of them, let's put it up. Half of them, we'll put it below. Yeah, fuck it. We'll see which one yeah. looks better. Uh, a bunch of the guys with longer names. Yeah. I, I saw the Verlander one. Yeah, they like, I guess they just like didn't have a fucking plan for how to handle that. So they just, the names like wrap, it looks like a rainbow. Yeah, it's like, like a wrap big around, arch. Big yeah. ass U, uh, upside down U. And then like the smaller names, they're like, it's almost like bunched together. Yeah. And like really tiny compared to the other ones. Ridiculously inconsistent. Uh, but the funniest part of this so far was that the pants are see-through. Mm-hmm. So like all these Major League Baseball guys, part of what they try to knock out during spring training is like the the media shit right. Like that the, the team uses for marketing. So they take photos of the dudes and like they're like, all right, Cade, stand there with a, a baseball bat and like, you know, like you're getting warmed up. And j- like the shit they use for like TV graphics and stuff, right? They do a lot of that. But guys kept having like their balls and dick out. Yeah, they had their Randy Johnson out. Because the pants were see-through. Yeah. Just transparent. It doesn't just like something you figure they would probably 
catch early on in the quality control process, but not fanatics, Kate. Right, yeah, no, like, in, while they're testing them, I'm like, oh, wait, hey, I could see your dick. Like, I mean, no, 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 it's fine. Yeah. We're moving on. Yeah, Michael Rubin, a staunch anti-quality control uh, leader. The guy does not fuck with quality control, and as such, all of his products are terrible. Um, the patches are, like, inc- like, like, just... Everything about these looks slightly worse than before. That's what's... It just yeah. looks like they just got real cheap with it. Just fucking decided to make everything slightly shittier. And they're getting roasted off the face of the earth yet again. Every time Fanatics does something. So like once a month, somebody will get a Fanatics package that they ordered that's just embarrassingly fucked up. And they'll take pictures of it and tweet it out. And then Fanatics goes viral again for being terrible because everyone who has ever bought something from Fanatics has experienced the disappointment of actually handling the product because it's just the worst. But somehow, Michael Rubin, because he throws like that cool all white party or whatever, has gotten every fucking league to agree to let him be a part of it somehow. Like doing Major League Baseball jerseys, he has some partnership with the NBA that I'm not. Oh, is that why all their jerseys are dog shit now too? Maybe. I mean, that would explain a lot. more of just, yeah, design stuff, but yeah. But my God, this this fucking Fanatics company is awful. Here's a quote from one publication, on3.com. It says, while the pants have faced plenty of scrutiny, the jerseys themselves also appear different and worse in the eyes of fans and players. The numbers and lettering appear smaller and less vivid, appearing more like screen printing than an embroidered or stitched element. It's not the quote you want if you're Michael Rubin and Fanatics after the first week of these jerseys. Here's a headline from DailyHive.com. Fanatics fails. 17 times fans were fed up with unpopular sports merch company. 17? Yeah, I feel like that number could be higher too. Jesus. Uh, It says... uh, (laughs) Apparently, Major League Baseball is trying to get out in front of all the controversy surrounding the jerseys this past week and a half, and they're saying in a statement to ESPN that adjustments are being made to the jerseys and pants based on the feedback from players during spring training. So feedback like, hey, everyone can see my asshole. <laughs> yeah, I think you could, could fix that for me. You guys make these less translucent? Yeah, that's also the thing with like white clothing. Sometimes like it is like... You can see through it for yeah, but like this is an uh, this is known in the baseball world. Yeah. Every baseball player at some point has had a shitty pair of white baseball pants that were kind of see through. Yeah, so and, you have to know on the like on the highest possible level, making these for the major league players. Like surely, if you had the experience, you would be aware. Like all right, there's something you do to make the white pants not see through. Right, and I think it's more layers of fabric. Mm-hmm. They just. They didn't do enough layers, it seems like, I guess. So everybody's just hanging dong oh, yeah. <laughs> unintentionally, you know? Uh, so this is Fanatic's, like, first season doing this stuff? Yeah, but doing been the Major League Nike Baseball jerseys. The past few years? Yeah. So I don't know how long Nike okay. was in charge of but there's still going to be Nike on these jerseys. Yeah. Just also that shitty little Fanatic's patch that lets you know it's the worst thing ever made. <laughs> uh, so how the hell did he get in there like how- I, I really don't know that's what I'm saying I think he's just so connected and they probably are able to a lot like to offer really really competitive pricing because they're making just terrible things and yeah. don't have to pay for quality control at all uh that has to be it because I I honest to God like everyone knows that fanatic sucks everyone and yet somehow at the highest level of sports he continues to get more and more deals, and Fanatics continues to expand. And they bought, like, Mitchell and Ness, which is oh, devastating no. to Mitchell and Ness fans like me because you know all that's going to suck now, and it's still going to cost the same. Right. They're still going to charge you $500 for a pair of Rocket shorts. Just now when you get them, it's everyone too- will be able to see your dick and balls because <laughs> they're completely <laughs> see-through. That's that's all their their clothing from now. It's just it's that's their new You're angle. Gonna, you're gonna see dick and balls. Maybe it's the wave of the future. Just super see through clothing. Yeah. You know, you just gotta show everyone what you're working with. That's we don't want to hide in the dark anymore. No. We want no. we want our dick and balls out in the open. Yeah. No more shame. No. <laughs> be, be who you are. <laughs> show your true self. Uh, anyway, it's gonna be interesting to see how this fanatics MLB uh, story 
continues to unfold and whether or not they're able to like actually get their shit together. And here, here's the fucking thing that really pisses me off. They likely will fix the actual MLB jerseys. Like I doubt very much on opening day guys are going to be coming out with see-through pants. But we'll still... <laughs> Damn. <laughs> the fact that it was even a possibility is, is unbelievable. But we... Well, the consumers, like if we go order shit from Fanatics, we'll get the shitty stuff. Yeah. They don't care about us. No, they don't give a fuck. At all. So, and it's mostly like kids, you know? Kids don't bitch and moan online nearly as much as adults do. So, like, the kids are getting shafted and they're all getting this translucent product. And then they don't, nobody cares. Our parents who gave it to them just move on with their lives. Right. Meanwhile, if I want to order a goddamn throwback now... You're going to be seeing your nipples. My nipples <laughs> showing through the front. <laughs> Moving on. Cade, I keep seeing internet memes and jokes referencing gooners okay. over the past couple weeks. Have you seen this? Have you heard about this? I have not seen this. I have not heard okay. about this. Okay. It made me feel better because I it's striking me as like a Zoomer term that has bubbled up. It probably is. That the Gen Z kids are aware of yeah. and that the olds like me are, are disconnected from. And today I wanted to figure out what it, like this morning I saw yet another Gooner meme. Um, this one from noted meme maker and distributor Trash Can Paul on Instagram. So I finally broke and I Googled what is a Gooner while well, actually while I was sitting at the car wash. And, uh, <laughs> and I got a few definitions here that I wanted to share with everybody who's, who's maybe been exposed to this word or will be exposed to it and needs to know what it means. Um, it says Gooner. It's internet slang. For someone who practices gooning, so far not helpful. <laughs> then it says, gooning is a form of masturbation that involves edging for a long period of time, causing a hypnotic trance-like state. So uh, if you don't know what edging is, then we have to go another layer further. Do you know what edging is? No, I was about to ask oh, you. Oh, I got your back. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so edging is when you pleasure yourself, but not to fruition, to just before fruition, and you maintain this for as long as you can. Okay. So gooning is doing that so often that you become a drooling idiot in a trance-like state, which I didn't realize was really a thing. Here's another definition of gooning. One who is completely and miserably addicted to porn but embraces and loves it. First person that pops into my mind as a gooner, Kanye West. That's a gooner. If you become so obsessed and into porn that you're showing it to coworkers at the office yeah. and involving it in meetings you're leading, you're a gooner. Here's another definition of gooner. A man who watches porn, parentheses, typically gay, in parentheses, all day long and strokes <laughs> and strokes his for hours while edging nonstop and becomes retarded in the process. <laughs> Did you find that on Urban Dictionary? Yes. <laughs> okay. It says the <laughs> It says the only thing the last two are from Urban Dictionary. Oh, okay. It says the only thing that matters to him is his dick and nothing else. And then it gives you an example. <laughs> it gives you an example of two people using Gooner in a conversation. Person one says, Man, I love watching gay porn. I can't get enough of it. Exclamation point. And then person two says, Bro, you are such a gooner. I don't know if that makes him a gooner, though. He just likes <laughs> gay porn. Like, that's just like his... Yeah, but he can't his... get enough of it, Cade. Oh, uh, okay. That's where... Oh, that's... See, if he just said, I love watching gay porn, you that doesn't make a him a gooner. Yet. Yeah. No, he's got to be full he, on. He can't get enough of it. He yeah. can't stop watching it. Yeah. So that, that's what makes him a gooner. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow, no, I did not know about this. No, it's something to keep an eye on. I'm going to see it all the time now, I feel like. Because my well, phone... our phones are listening, so... Yeah. Just Much like the Sauron give, shirt thing, yeah. Yeah, served a bunch of Gooner memes. I actually got served in a Walla. No fucking way. The other day, yeah. I was, you know, how I said mine fell off my car. Might yeah. have been Patreon that I was talking about this. My wife got me this giant cup. Long story short, it fell off my car because I drove off with it on the roof of my car. Um, and I was like, "Damn, I've ruined it." And now I kind of like that it's got some. It looks like it was attacked by a dog, basically. Yeah. I kind of like that it's got some. It character. has some character. Yeah. 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 It's been through some shit. Yeah. You know, it's not brand new. I'm not just some bougie white girl right. who's like, ooh, look at me with my giant Yeah, it's water. like you've had it for- like, this was in a war with me. Yeah. You know, like I went to battle with it. Mm -hmm. It was like you were ahead of the wave. By the way, I could 100% kill a human with this. 
Like yeah, if, you no, just, <laughs> if you were just like oh, being attacked, like you could 100% beat somebody to death with this fucking gigantic <laughs> cup. So maybe that's what people like that meth addict to the car wash will see my cup and go, oh, I can't uh, fuck with this yeah, guy. No, he's going to Might as well be a pistol. A yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, okay. that's not how you want to go out. No. Just being death by a walla. Clubbed to death by no. a giant white woman's water <laughs> bottle. Anyway, that's what a gooner is. Uh, you're welcome for that. In closing, it is rodeo week back where I'm from in Houston, Texas. Yeehaw! The Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo is going on. Kate, have you ever been to a rodeo? Never been. You know what a rodeo entails? Uh, Some wrangling. Some There's wrangling for sure. Some riding, I don't know, bulls. And riding. riding and wrangling. Riding and wrangling. Uh, bulls, you said? Bulls and I'm sure some horses and yeah, cows and... Yeah. Farm animals. Farm animals, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I like. Do they do the thing where like they like let a bull loose and like the person has to like try and like avoid it? Away? Yeah. Well, it's you're partial. You're almost all the way there. They let the bull loose with a man on the back of the oh, bull. Okay. He rides the bull for as long as he can until it bucks him, and there's a counter. You know, it's like yeah, he made it twelve it's seconds like, or yeah. whatever. And once he gets knocked off, there's a clown. It has to run out the rodeo clown. to distract the bull mm-hmm. so that the bull doesn't just gore the man who was previously riding him to death. And then when the clown gets charged by the bull, it has to jump into a barrel and hide. Oh, he's not like taking like a like a red. No, that's sheet. a whole that's a whole different thing. That's oh, okay. in Spain. Oh, okay. a red sheet. I don't know. <laughs> that's a good point. I don't actually know what that thing is called. The red blanket. Yeah, that's flag. a matador. Yeah, a matador. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's. Sort of, you were almost there, but yeah, there's bull riding, wrangling, okay, clowns, barrels. sounds like a, a very fun time. It actually is really fun. There's a lot of drinking, mm. so this is a pretty good good example of like an event that like would be weird sober. Yeah, if you're seeing, you know, just like standing there watching this unfold dead sober, it'd be yeah. awkward. But uh, yeah, most people are are doing a lot of drinking and partying. I mean, the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo is a ridiculously large production with tens of thousands of people and uh, a lot of food and alcohol and f- and like there's like a Ferris wheel and all kinds of carnival shit too outside of it. But the actual rodeo itself is like. Uh, there's different competitions with horses, with bulls, cows, fucking, at one point they like, they let a bunch of sheep out into the middle, it's a, it's a lot of it takes place in like a stadium. Yeah. They let all these sheep out and then they, they make kids chase the sheep or something like that. And you know what, now that I'm thinking about it a little harder, I think similarly to the way they have men riding bulls, they just let little kids ride sheep. Like small children, like oh, five year olds. I can't like go out. And no, ride no, no. A sheep. You you okay. wouldn't be allowed. You're. I have to go ride a bull. Yeah, you don't mm, want to. That doesn't sound. No, that's fun. It don't, sounds more dangerous. Don't do that. No. But uh, you know, everybody dresses up like a cowboy. Not everybody. I never really did, but I thought it was kind of <laughs> cheesy. It's just weird. I yeah. don't know. It freaked me out a little bit. Um, people wear boots, cowboy hats, Wranglers. You know, pearl snap shirts and shit. And uh, it's a good old. Good old time. I went a lot when I was a kid, and I got kind of burned out on it. So, like, in high school and college, I had friends that were still super into the Houston Rodeo and would go back every year and, like, host tents, and you can become part of, like, the the group of people that helps put it on, and you get some status as a result or something. I, I wasn't paying attention. But I was kind of out on this whole thing, especially since I quit drinking. I was like, ah, oh, I don't want to be around all you drunk people yelling about cows and shit. That just doesn't feel like it's for me. But now that I'm on the non-alcoholic beer wagon, maybe I'd fit back in a little bit better. Um, but it's fun. It's it it's, sounds it is like fun. A, a good time. It's yeah. fun to take like kids and shit too. You know, they're like, "Oh my god, a cow!" Yeah. When you're a little kid, like seeing a cow is for the, for the first time, mind yeah. blowing. Wow. Um. So maybe next year. Next year, when RJ is a little older, we'll take you down to the old Houston rodeo, kid. But we'll have to dress you up accordingly. See, I don't think I could. You do have that. to. Oh. That's the rule. Go what? Rock the cowboy hat. See, you got to do it. <sighs> Doesn't feel like a a Houston thing. Though. It is. It it's, is. It, yeah. We have we Houston is incredible because it's this melting pot of like that vibe. Yeah. Western cowboy shit and hip hop. 
Okay, you, see, I think so I like, like the hip hop side more. So of like Houston. Bun B is in charge of the concert series this year at the Houston Rodeo, I believe is the okay. case. I could be wrong, and there's probably some Houstonian yelling at me right now because I'm I'm incorrect. But like in some capacity, he has helped put on this musical performance. Every year there's like a bunch of headliners. So it'll be like Jason Aldean and fucking nice. you know, like uh like Bun B. Like there's just, it's a weird clash where you're like shitty country artists. And like Beyonce did it one year. It was a huge deal, you know? Right. Um, but uh but Bun B has got all these rappers doing it now, and like they all go in all black cowboy outfits. So like black hat, black button down, black jeans, black boots. That's tough. Like, I like Slim that. Thug was yeah. there. So you could go that route. Okay. Nobody's saying you have to look like a traditional cowboy doofus. Okay. So yeah, I can put my own flavor and style. Yeah. On it. All right. A gooner cowboy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but, dude, truth be told, I don't even have, like, a real cowboy hat anymore. All I have is that one that I wear sometimes. But yeah. that's from Montana. So that's, uh, like, a that's not a Texas cowboy hat. No. That's a Montana cowboy hat. It's, like, felt. And, yeah, and they're very different, you know. Super the two different. cowboy hats, yeah. Well, th- yeah, they are. Yeah. So we, we need to go, you and I, down to, like, Allen's Boots on South Congress and buy some cowboy hats. All right, and Boots. Well, yeah, I don't know. That's a lot of money we're talking about yeah. in one purchase now. Because I think the hats alone are pretty fucking expensive. Yeah. All this shit costs. You don't know it, but these people running around in Western wear, they've spent a lot of money on that shit. Yeah. And the, like, I, I don't know why we have it in Austin, though. Because, like, again, Austin, I don't think about no fucking people in cowboy hats and boots and shit. Like, what? Austin's just fucking weird. Like, I think more hippie vibes. Sure. So I don't, but it's there underneath. Yeah, but like, so when it's I like see it out in public, I'm like, you're, that's not really Austin, you know? The, the, yeah, but that's, you can tell when it's like a real cowboy versus just some poser fuck who wants the vibes, yeah. which is, you know. It's all the people doing it here. And everyone at the rodeo. Yeah. Like 99% yeah, see, of the Yeah, see, I'm not trying to look like a poser. Yeah, it's fine, though. It's it's good old-fashioned fun. I used to hate this, that concept a lot, like... Because I went to college with a lot of dudes who dressed like cowboys that had never worked on a ranch. Mm-hmm. And it was like, come on, man. You're just biting this lifestyle. But now I just don't care anymore. I think it, whatever. Whatever makes people happy. Some people love wearing a cowboy hat, dude. It's fun. Have you ever put it on? You no. feel like fucking Woody, the sheriff in Toy Story. No, I've never worn a cowboy we hat. we got to get you a cowboy hat. Oh, man. We're going to do it. All right. You know what? I'm going to wear my cowboy boots with my suit on Patreon this week just to have a little added flavor. I wore my black cowboy boots to uh, to Barrett's wedding. Tuxedo black boots. Then it has some, some nicer shoes. These or, are very nice. Well, I know they're expensive. Th- those boots cost more than any pair of shoes I own times two. I didn't buy them. Uh, part, of this, part of the ticket here. They were okay. given to me as a gift but uh, by a rich person. <laughs> <laughs> But they, that's, I love I love wearing the black boots with the tux. It looks tight. See, I feel like because they're so like high up, like I feel like they're such a pain to get on and off. I'm just like I don't want to. You gotta have pants. Oh, you mean yeah? They're hard to get on and off, yeah. sort of. If you don't have the right socks on, especially. Yeah, and what what would those be? Because I'm just rocking Nike socks. I don't actually know. Okay. <laughs> Dress socks. Dress socks. But then your feet are sliding around yeah. too much in there. I feel I like. So I don't know. Maybe you got to pay one price one way or the other. Yeah, yeah, I gotta pay pay the price to look good, you know. Yeah, you know what? Since we're, I just this just occurred to me. It doesn't really have anything to do with anything. Uh, but on oysters, clams, and cockles, how we're doing Shogun? Yeah, and it's Shogun. Shogun, but I call it Shogun. Yeah. Should we call the audience Gooners? <laughs> <laughs> you could, you could do that. It is your show. I'm allowed to make the rules. Huh? <laughs> yeah. And, wait, aren't you going oysters, clams, and uh, katanas? Katanas, I think. But okay. kimonos is also a good. I like both of those. Yeah. Maybe run it by the the clam fam. They're the ones who came up with those two ideas. Okay. So, I think I'll probably watch the first two episodes tonight and decide: are there more katanas so, or kimonos? Yeah. Or maybe there's another word we haven't even thought of. Yeah. It's a good point. Yeah. I do wonder. Like, I know where to buy a cowboy hat. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I know where to go. Yeah. Where do you buy a kimono other than the obvious internet? Like, you know, in, if in person I wanted to go find a good kimono in Austin, Texas, like, could it be done? Oh, uh, okay. 
The first thing I Google, these are just dresses for yeah. women. <laughs> it's a different kimono. Kimono for Damn, are there no men. kimonos targeting men in, 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 in uh, modern fashion? It's just... Oh, here's one. This is tight. $375. God damn. But look at this fucking thing. How fly is that? Look at that. Look at that thing. Yeah, no, that's that's pretty that sick. That is baller. Because yeah. a kimono is kind of like a robe. A little bit, yeah. Right? And we do and that it looks here. Like, like silk almost. Looks, like it looks like very looks, nice. And, I might need this, yeah. whatever this is. I might need a credit card. What about a katana? You gonna, I don't know if I should start carrying a sword. I'm around small children a lot. But you not know? no for like the studio, you know, get, hanging up as a design. Okay, that's yeah. a great fucking idea. Yeah, yeah. That's how I'm gonna spend the rest of my day is trying to find kimonos and katanas, katanas yeah. for OCC. Uh, that will do it for today's show. Remember, Kate and I will be back later this week with another ad-free premium edition of RBP available exclusively on patreon.com slash Ross Boland Podcast with all new content available. And this week we'll be joined by Dan. The ad salesman, our newest employee here at Bolin Media. As I mentioned, we finally got a full-time ad sales guy after four years, almost coming up on five years of Bolin Media's existence. Um, prior to Dan, uh, as I'll explain on Patreon this week, my wife was kind of filling in the gaps where she could, and frankly, we just were not able to get it done that way. We needed we needed somebody focused on it full-time. We're very excited to have Dan. Very excited for all of you to meet him on patreon.com slash Ross Bolin podcast this week. And in that same vein, please support our sponsors by hitting the links in the description of this episode and using our dedicated codes. That is how we pay the bills here at Bolin Media this week. We have Liquid IV, which you can buy at liquidiv.com. When you use code ROSS at checkout, you will get 20% off your first order. Liquid IV is awesome. Longtime sponsor. Love them. And, of course, also shopify.com slash RBP, all lowercase, for a $1 per month trial period of Shopify. And you can find links to all of our sponsors for today's episode in the description below. To check out our other shows, go to bowlandmedia.com or simply search on whatever platform you prefer, for Formula Bone, our premier F1 programming here at Bolin Media, hosted by Jared J-Bone, Boris Lowe, whose birthday it is today, I would note. Happy birthday to old J-Bone. We'll go pull him out of the attic with his gimp suit and give him a good kick later. Yeah, good spanking in little the backyard. Birthday, birthday yeah. kick and spank. Uh, Oysters, Clams, and Cockles, where we are beginning coverage of Shogun on Hulu and FX this week with the first two episodes and then, of course, Houston sports fans, check out Banging the Can as well. Follow our show on Instagram, Twitter, X, TikTok. Subscribe on YouTube. Just search the Ross Boland Podcast. We're on all the different platforms. Mr. Oris, where can the people follow you? You can follow me on all the social media platforms at Cade Oris. That's K-A-D-E-O-R-R-I-S. Yeah, you can follow me at W.R. Bolin on X. And Instagram. Yeah. Where I put up photos in my stories. My dogs. My kids. That's, that's about it. That's about it, yeah. Maybe an, a non-alcoholic beer every once in a while. Oh, I cooked another meal this week. I'll talk about that on Patreon, though. You got to go to Patreon if you want to hear about my cooking journey. Things are mm. getting intense. Things are heating up. Ah, uh, you could say that. Yeah. This episode of RBP is presented by Bolin Media. Video of today's show was produced by Kate Oris. Go to youtube.com slash at the Ross Bolin podcast for full video of our show, plus funny clips in the form of YouTube shorts. We'll be back soon. Until next time, peace be with you and also with you.